Good afternoon and welcome to this lunchtime's session on the uh, accessible information regulations and the support grant. I am Tim Rivet and I run Artig. Um, we are recording this session and we'll share the uh, the link to the recording and the slides with you afterwards so you don't need to take notes particularly. Um, and uh, there are a few opportunities for Q&A as we go through, but uh, if you want to feel free to use the chat so you don't uh, forget anything as we go along, then please do so. So uh, we have a look at why the regulations are being brought in, have a quick run through the regulations um, and then uh, have a Q&A on the regulations if you've got any, and then look at the grant and the uh, other types of support that are available to you. And again, Q&A at the end. So why are the accessible information regulations being brought in? Um, travel, particularly when you are in an area that you don't know is a high anxiety experience. Uh, if you've ever travelled to somewhere you don't know, you're not quite sure what bus you need to get, where you are, because perhaps it's uh, you know it's a cold, dark, wet night, and all the windows are steamed up on the bus, uh, and you're not sure where you are, then you're going to get it stressed very easily. If you take away some of uh, people's senses, so uh, if you've got visual impairment or a hearing impairment if you've got a learning uh, or cognitive impairment, uh, then that just exacerbates those challenges that you've got. Um, and so uh, travel is particularly high uh, anxiety. And we know that people with uh, impairments uh, have a much less, are much less likely to travel and to make journeys anyway. Um, and so um, if we can do something to help make the journeys easier, then uh, that's surely a good thing. Um, back in 2014, the Guide Dogs for the Blind did survey of their members um, and over 70% of visually impaired people had uh, had some form of problem where they'd missed a stop uh, and had to uh, to go back. Uh, or uh, actually just missed an appointment, something like that, because bus driver whom they'd asked to tell them, uh, to, to let them know when they get to a particular stop, had forgotten to do that. Now, that's understandable. Um, it's a challenging role that drivers have got. They are fundamentally there to uh, to drive, and particularly if you've got a busy bus, it's very easy to uh, forget which passengers asked about which stop. Um, so um, this is something that has been identified in London many years ago and for the last 15 years Transport for London vehicles have had audiovisual announcements on board and uh, any uh, train rolling stock that's new onto the uh, onto the network since 1998's had audiovisual information. So it's not particularly new technology. It's quite well proven and understood. Um, and uh, these regulations uh, mean that it uh, applies to uh, buses everywhere. Um, and the reason for the regulations is while some operators have been installing it, London you know, mandated as part of conditions of, uh, of franchise. Um, other operators have been doing it commercially. So um, outside of London, though, in England, um, only 29% of uh, buses back in 2022-3 had audiovisual equipment on. Wales a bit better off at 37% and Scotland at 35%. So there's still a significant proportion of the bus fleet that hasn't got audiovisual information. And because of the uh, that, the Department of Transport have decided to introduce regulations last year. 
uh, to uh, to require equipment to be fitted. So what do the regulations require? They require pretty much every local bus or coach service to provide audio announcements and visual information to passengers identifying the route, where it's going uh, and each upcoming stop and some other things like diversions. So it's applicable to um, buses and coaches operating local services uh, in England, Scotland and Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, if any of you are uh, operating um, over there, there's a different regime. Um, there are a few exemptions um, and we'll have a look at those next. But basically, if you operate a local bus service, then you're in scope of the regulations now local bus service isn't defined in the regulations it refers back to previous bus service acts um, and so um, this also does cover um, rail replacement services this is not linked to psvar so there are some subtle differences in in applicability for vehicles and things like that but if you operate rail replacement where um, you uh, are doing it in a way that means it meets local bus service criteria, then it's in scope. So fundamentally, if uh, you're operating where rail stations are less than 15 miles away from each other in a straight line, then you're in scope and that forms the majority of the route. So if you were doing rail replacement from London to Newcastle and you just stopped in Doncaster and York or so, you know, that sort of thing, then that's clearly not local. But if you're covering a local branch line with lots of stations in close proximity, you're almost certainly going to be in scope for rail replacement. So there are a number of uh, exemptions. So the regulations don't apply to uh, small vehicles, so less than 17 passengers, uh, really old vehicles, typically, you know, sort of heritage type vehicles that are, uh, you know, over 50 years old now. Um, if you're running excursions or tours where people are all going to the same destination, um, closed door home to school service are uh, exempt but if you are open door and let on uh, anybody if they pay the fare then they are in scope um, long distance um, demand responsive flexible services those that don't operate a fixed route and timetable um, and if you are operating under a community bus service license section 22 then if you've got vehicles uh, that were first used before October last year, then they're exempt. But if you've got new vehicles, uh, they will be in scope. So to help with the implementation, um, the regulations come in based on the age of vehicle. Um, and this is for when the vehicle was first used for local bus service this might be different to when you first used it so if you acquired it vehicle second hand then it's not when you first use it it's when the vehicle was first used so uh, if you're unsure you might need to track back uh, a little bit um, so newest shiny new vehicles after october this year uh, they've got to be fitted um, so if you've got vehicles in a uh, manufacturing backlog um, and you place the order you know, a couple of years ago, you might need to revisit the spec of those vehicles if they're going to be first used after um, October to make sure that they're fitted from new. Vehicles that are five years old in October, they will need to be fitted by October this year. Um, all the way down to uh, 50 year old vehicles not needing to be fitted until uh, 2026. But that's still only two years ago and will soon be upon us. 
Um, if you are one of the operators that has invested in audiovisual equipment over the last few years, then you may be eligible for partial compliance. So if you had audio and visual uh, equipment installed, um, then um, you don't have to fully meet all of the requirements until October 2031. So you might have got um, a audiovisual system that doesn't do some of the requirements of the regulations like uh, alerts or handle diversions and things like that, then uh, that's OK. Um, but you've got until uh, October 2031 to make that compliant. If things fail and you need to, to replace equipment and things like that, then you will need to make sure that what you're replacing it with does meet the requirements, though. Um, the advice is that um, you keep some documentation and, and evidence that you had kit installed before October last year to uh, be able to prove that you have partial compliance in case of any inspection. Um, if you've got um, uh, existing equipment and it, so audio visual and you don't have um, a hearing loop installed and we'll come on to more about that in a minute um then that's okay under the partial compliance you don't need to uh, retrofit a hearing loop so what do you need to provide uh, under the regulations you need to provide audio information that has to come out over speakers um and that has to be um understandable and intelligible for 51% uh, of seated passengers. Um, and the way that that is defined in the regulation is uh, three decibels above the background noise. So that uh, should be loud enough for you to be able to hear what's being said uh, and understand it. Um, but it shouldn't be louder than 84 decibels. Uh, which in some older vehicles in hilly areas might be a challenge. Um, it's uh, suggested that uh, you need to test the intelligibility both stationary but also at uh, 5 and 20 miles an hour to get uh, some real world experience. Um, where does the 84 decibel maximum come from? That comes from health and safety legislation. Um, if you've got uh, um, a environment with um, background noise of uh, 84 decibels or more, then you need to be providing uh, some form of hearing protection for people that are exposed to that on a regular basis. So um, regulations clearly don't want to mean that you have to put hearing um, protection in for drivers and things like that, which is where the 84 decibels comes from as well as uh, information coming over speakers. You also need to provide information through hearing loop. So you've probably seen uh, these sort of systems in place in banks and shops and council offices and things like that. And you'll have seen the uh, the, the the stickers that have got the, uh, the, the blue stickers with a T on. Um, so if somebody has a hearing aid and has got T-switch, then they will hear what's being announced through the hearing loop into their hearing aid. Um, the regulation requires that the hearing loop covers at least the priority and wheelchair space. Um, it doesn't need to cover the full plate of the vehicle, but you might actually find that it's easier to install across the whole vehicle than just in the priority and wheelchair space. Um, and as well as fitting, you need to provide signage in the areas that are covered so people know about it. Um, you also need to provide visual information to passengers. Um, again, 
that needs to be visible and impeded to 51% of seated passengers. Clearly, if you're if you've got a bus on a journey that's full with standing passengers, um, you're not going to be able to meet that requirement, which is why it's uh, for seated passengers without standing. Um, so that's unimpeded um, across both decks if it's a double decker. Um, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, there are some requirements about minimum character height. Um, obviously, you can go bigger than that um, and other things like not using all capitals and things like that because people with uh, learning disabilities and visual impairment find uh, all capitals harder to read. Um, the um, Perhaps the biggest uh, area of uh, confusion with the visual coverage is for new vehicles after October this year where you've got a rearward facing wheelchair bay uh, then you need to provide an additional display for those rearward facing passengers uh, and some people have been thinking that you need to retrofit you don't this is only a requirement for new vehicles now some operators are proactively retrofitting uh, but you don't have to so um, what information do you need to provide you need to provide route information so when the vehicle's stationary and passengers are boarding, you need to tell them what the route name or number is and uh, information that will help them know where they're going. So that's either the final stopping point or if you've got a circular service, which way round the loop it's going, for example. Um, so they've got confidence that they're boarding, they're getting on the right bus, going in the right direction. Um, and um, as the uh, vehicle is getting towards the end of the route, you need to provide an alert to tell people that you're coming to the last stop and it's time to get off. Um, while you're en route, um, you need to provide for every stop, whether or not you're stopping there, the name of the next stop. Um, and um, the timing of that might need some thought because you want that to, to be provided long enough in advance for people to go, aha, that's the stop I want, find the button and uh, the driver to stop safely without having to do an emergency stop. Um, and so um, that's a challenge in some urban environments when you're leaving um, centres for example and you've got stops every three or four hundred yards and you might be doing 30 miles an hour if there's not much traffic around um, so you know that they're, they're quite close together um, at the other end of the spectrum if you're running a rural route and you've got stops in each village but the villages are you know, three or four miles apart um, you might not want to uh, have the announcement um, straight after the last stop, you might want that to be uh, when you're closer to the stop so people don't forget and it gives more people uh, confidence that um, they are where they're going to be because what you don't want is somebody hearing the next stop is, you know, the post office in a village and them standing up and getting ready to, uh, to, to get off the bus when you've got you know, a few miles to drive still. Um, and um, the name that you use for the next stop has to be recognisable, so it's got to be appropriate um, and it's got to be consistent with other information that they might come across. So if they've planned a journey, either online through a journey planner or an app uh, or using printed information, uh, the name that they will have seen on that information needs to be consistent with what's on street. Uh, and also what is used um, on the vehicle as well. Now, recognise that um, quite often there's there's a bit of debate about what the correct name of a stop should be. 
um the the recommendation is that where there is a disagreement or that take that to your enhanced partnership um you should pretty much everybody uh, is involved in one of those um and uh, and address that through the partnership because um you might think it's one thing another operator might think it's something else and the council might think it's uh, a third name so uh, so partnership is probably the best way to uh, to deal with that where you've got everybody represented um in addition to um the route information and each stop point where you've got a hail and ride section you haven't got bus stops um so you need to alert people that you're starting a hail and ride section or finishing it and where it's a long section you might want to think about additional information uh, we're now going through a particular village or uh, we're just passing a particular crossroad something like that uh, it's not mandated but uh, it's uh, it's recommended to help people understand particularly on longer sections of hail and ride uh, where they are and so therefore where they might need to get off um and um where you have diversions you need to be uh, alerting passengers to the fact that the bus is going off route um and when it's back on route um and this is one of those situations where historically you might have only updated your route information through the bus open data service and with uh, dvsa uh, where the diversion is uh, for an extended period of time you know a few months um, but um, you might want to think about doing that a bit more proactively for shorter diversions uh, shorter duration diversions because then you can reprogram your kit make it consistent with other uh, information in journey planners and things like that um, and uh, it's not it's no longer a diversion um, and so you don't need to get a driver involved to press a button to tell people buses going off route and things like that to, to sort of ease the load of, of drivers uh, however you're not going to be able to do that in every situation because it's inevitable at some point you're going to go around a corner and find that there's uh, roadworks there's a burst water main or a police incident or something like that and you have to uh, to do something uh, unplanned so in those situations driver needs to be able to trigger something that's going to make the announcement that the bus is going on a diversion come on excuse me um so once you've got all of this in place um, it's not a case of fitting and forgetting. Um, you do need to keep the information that's presented uh, up to date because one thing that um, has been um, picked up time and time again by those that have installed things um, already is that passengers are quite sensitive to what's being announced and will let you know when things are wrong if if stops are missing or um incorrect so um in addition to um making sure that the equipment's working um it's also suggested that you think through and work out how you're going to respond to passengers and how you let drivers know how to respond when passengers uh say that something's not working or something's wrong you know the stop name's wrong or you've missed out this stop on 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 the announcements um and how drivers can report that back to you uh in the back office um so think through that um you need to make sure the kit's working the regulations require you to uh, to have it operational not just fitted um so uh speakers relatively easy to test yeah, and drivers are going to notice when things stop working likewise a display quite easy just to uh, to have a peer at it uh, on a regular basis make sure it's it's working 
Um, however, hearing loop, unless you've got a hearing aid with a T-switch yourself, you're not going to know whether the equipment's working or not. Um, some of the uh, equipment available has um, LEDs and lights that tell you whether it's working or not. Um, but that sort of technical working doesn't mean that what's being um, uh, put over the hearing loop is intelligible. And so um, you can get little um, receiver devices that you plug headphones into um, and they, uh, they, they act as though they're a, a T-switch on a hearing loop and you can just hear what's being uh, said over um, headphones. So it's probably worth investing in one of those less than 100 quid um, to test on a regular basis. You know, don't need to do it every day might want to do it once a month, something like that, just to make sure that it's uh, that it's working because it's not obvious with the hearing loops. So that's a quick whiz through the uh, regulations. Uh, have we got any questions about the regulations at this point? No, okay. Um, so probably the reason that you're all here um, is the grant that we've got. RTIG has been working with the Department of Transport for many years on things to do with public transport technology. Um, as a result of that and the um, advice and support that we've been giving them over the, uh, the, the wording of the regulations and guidance, um, they have asked us to manage on their behalf uh, a grant of four and a half million pounds for the smallest operators. Um, and that's as a result of um, the work that was done before the regulations were introduced. Um, whenever there's new regulations or laws, um, has to be what's called an impact assessment look at who's going to benefit and who's going to uh, have disbenefits as part of the introduction and one of the things that was identified with these regulations was that the financial impact of uh, installing and getting running and maintaining uh, audio visual information uh, was greater for the smallest operators than um, for larger operators because um, you get volume discount on on orders of course but also um, you, know, you need uh, some things whether you've got one bus or a hundred buses um, and so therefore you know the the cost per vehicle is greater when you've got fewer buses so um, the we've got a grant to give to the smallest operators um, to be eligible, you have to have fewer than 20 in scope vehicles. So 20 vehicles that under the regulations you would need to have fitted with this. Bear in mind rail replacement vehicles as well. Um, you can't be part of a bigger group because the group will almost certainly have more than uh, 20 vehicles in total. Um, and, you know, you've got to be... Uh, uh, in scope of the regulations, so it's got to be used as a local bus service. It's got to have more than 17 seats, and you can't already have uh, audio and visual equipment on board. Um, applications have to come direct from the operator. We've tried to make this a simple process. If you've ever applied for funding from government bodies in the past, this is not one where you need to write war and peace about why and what and the benefits and things like that. This is um, simple. Hopefully you should have everything that you need um, at your fingertips. Um, the, uh, the worst that you might have to do is have some conversations with your accountants to find out some of the information. Um, and we'll come on to uh, to why you might need to do that in a bit. So you can use the grant to buy equipment to meet the regulations. So that might be speakers, hearing loops, displays, that sort of thing. The kit that goes on bus to make, make it go as far as possible. 
um, we're not going to fund your surround sound audio system or your 70 inch 3d tv uh, on the vehicle we will though uh, fund minimum spec requirements so uh, basically that is we will fund led displays um, and standard vehicle uh, audio systems um, you may decide that you want to have a tft display um, so you can put adverts on or provide information uh, beyond the scope of the, of the regulations you know to do with the tractors and things like that you know this is where you got off for the zoo or something like that um, so if you decide that's what you really want then you get a quote for tft and get a quote for led um and we'll fund the the, the led quote and you just top it up to get what you really want um, we'll fund installation because you might buy equipment from a supplier and need to get somebody else to fit it um, some of the big uh suppliers uh they've got plenty of kit but they haven't got enough engineers to fit vehicles at the moment um, and so therefore you know, that's why you might need to get installation from somewhere else if you need software or something like that to manage the data and uh, and program the the system then um, we will uh, fund that and also first year's maintenance um, although most suppliers seem to be providing kit with two years, but you know, uh, we'll provide the first year's maintenance. Um, the process is, uh, as I've suggested, you get a quote from a supplier. Um, we don't need uh, three quotes or, or any of that rigmarole. Um, get a quote from your uh, preferred supplier. Um, we are having a look to make sure those costs are reasonable because you know we're getting applications in from uh, lots of different operators and suppliers and so we know whether you know uh, you, the quote that you get from a supplier is is out of kilter or not you know if you come back and say it's 20 grand a bust to get this fitted we're going to go have another think with another supplier um but uh, so far uh, things have been uh, all sort of roughly the same um, you fill out a simple grant claim form ask you for things like you know, what your bank account number is what your company number is what your own license is things that uh, you should know pretty readily um, where you might need to talk to an accountant is um, when you're completing the subsidy self-certification form so this grant is classed as state aid under the state aid regulations and so if you've had any form of uh, aid from uh, government organizations in the last three years we need to know about that because what we can't do is uh, give you grant that will tip you over that state aid limit and so uh, that's why we need to know that so that's and also why you might need to, uh, to talk to your accountant um, and then um, there's a set of terms and conditions that you need to uh, agree to so that is uh, pretty simple stuff we've tried to keep it as fair as possible so keep the kit working if you uh, sell a vehicle uh, and replace it with another one then um, make sure that the new vehicle's got kit on it or move it from vehicle you're getting rid of and install reinstall it on the new one um, keep it operational for five years and we'll have a process uh, whereby we'll ask you for evidence and we'll have somebody going around doing spot checks to make sure that the kit's working and installed so pretty simple process um, the challenge if you've not started um, application at the moment is uh, the applications close in just over a week's time on the 3rd of June at the moment um, suppliers are turning around quotes for standard type vehicles uh, within a day or two so that actually shouldn't be too much of a problem if you've got a very unusual vehicle then they might have to have a think about it um, but standard 
vehicles and configurations uh they just uh you know turn the handle very quickly um and um decision um should come in early july um the with the election being called um that shouldn't affect it because uh, by the time we've uh, done all the validation and uh, and due diligence on applications then uh, we wouldn't be seeking uh, DFT approval to uh, give contracts until uh, early July anyway. And so uh, things should be uh, getting back to normal um, by then. Um, in terms of decision as to who gets funding, um, once we've got the applications in, we will be uh, working through them all and uh, we will allocate uh, based on size so we'll start with operators that have got applications in that have got one vehicle and then look at operators with two vehicles and that sort of thing you know going up in in size until we uh, run out of money um we've got set of pages on our website with lots of information about the regulations and all the forms and links to uh, get to the application process. Um, we've got dedicated email address and uh, we will get back to you uh, very quickly for anything that you send through to that. Um, if you're new to audiovisual information, um, we've got a report on the uh, different types of displays and, and equipment um, and things that you might want to think about as you're planning uh, installations uh, and thinking about what you need to do for maintenance. Um, if there's questions, then, you know, just feel free to, uh, to ping them over. Um, and as I say, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. But um, we got any questions on the grant or the regulations? Or is it all clear? Feel free to get back to us uh, later if you don't want to uh, to ask in this forum. Yeah, hi, Callum. Hi. Um, now, what we were wondering was, it, you, you've got that the maximum is 20 vehicles in scope. So is that in total on your PSV license or is it just as in what you use for in scope with service work and rail replacement, et cetera? So, yeah, it's in scope of the regulations. So you might have 25 vehicles, but, you know, half a dozen of those, 10 of those might be little mini buses and out of scope. You could still apply. Um, on that because you the number of in scope vehicles you've got is is less than 20. OK, yeah, that's perfect. That's just what we wanted to double check because our old license has got more than the 20, but obviously it's less for what we actually need for in scope service work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Any more? No, OK, uh, do feel free to drop us an email or uh, give us a call um, if you have any questions uh, about the, the regulations or the grant um, at any point. Um, and uh, I'll thank you for your time and listening this afternoon and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.